Welcome to Midlife Mastery. I'm Brock Edwards, and midlife is such an underrated time of life. Um, I know you're here because you are excited about it. You are looking for ideas, information, inspiration on how to create an amazing midlife. And I am too, and that's why I interview the guests that I interview. I'm looking for those ways to improve my own life. And thank you for following along. You know, we now have listeners in 65 countries and continue to grow primarily through word of mouth. And so please keep sharing episodes you love with your friends. And if you enjoy this episode, if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a quick review, either wherever you're listening to it at, or that can sometimes be confusing. You can also leave a quick review at lovethepodcast.com slash midlife mastery lovethepodcast.com slash midlife mastery. And by leaving a review, leaving five stars, whatever, that lets me know what you really enjoy about the show so I can keep improving it. And it helps others learn about the show so more people can join us on this journey to really living a midlife they're excited about. And the best way to connect with me, if you want to reach out, is on Instagram. Post there a couple times a week usually, and of course, post all the episodes there and all that. And the Instagram is just at Midlife Mastery Podcast. So anyway, thank you for joining me on this journey. And today we are talking with Rayanne Louise. Now it took an emotional breakdown for Rayanne to realize she had really been living someone else's dream and help her get clarity on her own aspirations. So using that difficult path, she became a transformational life coach focused on helping women discover what they want to do with their lives and be able to live on their own terms. So in this episode, she shares her own journey, her breakdown to breakthrough at 53, changing perspective to change your life, visualizing the life you want, and picturing yourself as the person who leads that life. Creating a to-be list, not to-do list, a to-be list. I really like this idea. And what she refers to as soul power, and that that is an acronym. And she gets into what each of the letters stands for in the episode. So if you're ready to play bigger, create a fantastic midlife, let's get started. Well, I'm excited. Today's guest is Rayanne, and Rayanne, you are well a transformational life coach and really focus on helping people live their true selves. I think you call it live your true you. And let me ask you, how do you introduce yourself? I'm Rayanne. I go by actually Rayanne Louise, and but it's I'm a transformational life coach. And I help people who feel lost or stuck actually navigate a new direction so that they can live a more fulfilling and purposeful life. You know, so often we go into that, even in this midlife where we're stuck, we go, oh, what's my life all about? You know, what's my purpose? So that's what I help you do is find what you would actually love to do with your life. So as you're talking to people, I'm curious, do you see kind of patterns or commonalities amongst people kind of, you know, in this 50s, 60s midlife demographic as they hit this point? It's more of, it could be anything. It's, sometimes it's a matter of relationships. It could be a, like divorce. A lot of times it's empty nest right now as well, which I find is is quite common. It's like, oh my gosh, my children have left. Now I have no purpose. I, I've lost my identity. My identity is has been wrapped up in my children and you know taking care of them so and and that can be my experience as well it's it was like all of a sudden everything I did you know I'm a mom and you forget about who you are and you lose touch with yourself when you're doing everything for everyone else I sometimes say living someone else's dream becomes your nightmare so you're doing what's expected of you what you have to do and you forget about yourself in the process Yeah, I think that identity piece, I'm fascinated by the identity piece and kind of how we how we think of ourselves. And, you know, over time, we don't often build it consciously, right? Like, you know, just throughout our life, we we add bits and pieces, you know, become a parent, we identify that way, become a spouse, maybe we identify with our job. And then yeah, we get this kind of big life change that kind of makes us reevaluate or strips away part of that identity and leaves us wondering who we are. What's been your journey to this point? Like how, what, what inspired you to start trying to inspire others and deal with these kind of transitions? <laughs> well, actually it's, you know, my mess becomes my message and it was actually, it was having a breakdown. My breakdown became my breakthrough. So on New Year's Day, 2018, my husband of actually one year at that point said he wanted to leave me. And, you know, to back up a little bit in 2017, we made that proverbial leap of faith to, you know, move over to the island. He was going to leave his one business and start something online. 
and everything was working out really well, except the finances weren't rolling in. And that, you know, put a lot of strain on their relationship, like it does most relationships. And we were heading in that direction. And so when he said, you know, he wanted a divorce, it was like, okay, or I'm leaving you. It's like, okay. And it was just a combination of the, I had to go back to work and doing something I didn't want to do. So that put a lot of strain on me. It was a toxic environment. And uh, all of a sudden, Mother's Day weekend, 2018, I had a breakdown and I completely shut down. And it was, I didn't have the tools or the resources to figure out how to change things. I just knew I didn't want to live that way anymore. So it was funny because I was cleaning out, <laughs> cleaning out one of those junk drawers, you know, that we all have. And I came across this bookmark that my husband actually had when he went to a conference four years prior. And I'd seen this bookmark hanging around, but I never actually read it. And this day in particular, I looked at it and it said, inspiration without action is merely entertainment. Act on your inspiration today. And it was by Mary Morrissey. And I just, for some reason, I took action and I looked up who she was. And I just knew immediately, this is what I had to do, which was take this for myself. This, you know, it was called Dream Builder Program. And I took that and then it's like, no, this is what I need to do. Like, this is actually my calling because for years I knew I wasn't doing what I meant to do. I knew I was designed for more. That's not an egotistical thing. I just knew within me that there was a longing for more, to serve more. And um, so I enrolled to become a coach. And when I told my daughter, you know, what I was planning on doing, she's going, mom, how can you coach someone? Like your life is so messed up, but you know, and, and she's, she's right, you know, but God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the call. So I enrolled and I've just been like a thirsty sponge. I've studied with, you know, I did a year long program. I studied with friend of Richard, Tony Robbins, Claire Zamet. So I've just been doing this ever since. Well, from that breakdown, I mean, so you mentioned some of the key lessons, just like the the realization that the path you were on was not the path you you wanted to be on. And I suspect mm-hmm. a lot of people face that whether they have a breakdown or not, it's easy to, I think, kind of hit this point in midlife and look around and realize, you know, even if I'm in a good spot, this isn't where I thought I was going to be or how I was going to be. And it's, you know, it's one of the things that I love about it is, is we do get this chance to step back and rethink it. And no one ever tells us that, like at any moment we could step back and rethink it. And sometimes it does take exactly. that, you know, that shock to the system, that breakdown to, mm-hmm. to inspire that. I guess for you, what were some of kind of the, I don't know, the the key lessons that, that you took away from that breakdown? I mean, like I said, you mentioned already you weren't on the path you want to be on. Were were there any other lessons that you took from it? So for me, it's really, it is just like you mentioned too, is I call it step out of the frame you're in. So actually step out, really look at, you know, what do I want my life? What would I love my life to look like? And that question always resonates now whenever I'm looking at something that's like what would I love my life to be in in all areas and if there's something that isn't resonating it's like okay I need to change that and because nothing's going to change you can't wait for circumstances to change so for me it's really it's it's having a mindset it's being aware that I can make changes you know I don't have to be stuck in this either in a marriage in an unhappy marriage which I was because you know society you know you frown pound divorce you know back then and even that whatever but you have the ability to change you have the ability to design a life you'd love so that's I think a really big takeaway I had no clue I just thought I was going to be stuck with this life and even like honestly I had forgotten how to dream I got so far down because of either listening to people tell you what to do, listening to other people's opinions and beliefs and saying, no, you can't do that, or you can't have that, or even the beliefs that you're raised with, you know, and everyone's doing the best they can. But again, and you've got your own limiting beliefs. So it's really now I get to, you know, look at that. And I'm very aware now. And it's like, okay, no, 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 that's not, that's not who I am. Or, you know, all things are possible to the one who believes. So there is a power also breathing you. So for me, it's just been, I've just woken up to the realization that I can control what I, you know, my destiny really. I mean, things will happen, but it's again, how you react or respond to that. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned forgotten how to dream and that really stuck mm-hmm. me because, 
you know, when we're in our teens, when we're in our twenties, maybe even our thirties, I found for me anyway, a lot of my thought was what, what's the future going to be like? Yeah. You know, you're kind of waiting for your life to unfold very impatiently waiting for your life Mm -hmm. to unfold and thinking about, well, do I want to go this way? Do I want to go that way? And yeah, once we hit midlife or I think many times we're, we're settled, we're no longer thinking, well, what do I want to look like? It's more of just kind of living day to day. And so, yeah, anyway, I, I don't know that I have a question there, Rayanne. It just kind of struck no, me. I thought it was okay. a great that, phrase. And exactly. And, but it's the truth. And because again, you allow, and just what you were saying, you know, we get stuck and it's like, you know, we, we it's like quicksand, you know, and you just sink deeper and deeper and you just accept things as they are. And you just go through life the way it is. And it's just like, I don't know, you you kind of, in some cases, you lose that zest for life, that energy, that aliveness, because all the conditions, the circumstances, everything weighs on you. And you just, it's, it's just, it looks kind of dire and bleak. And especially coming out of COVID, like talking to a lot of people too with COVID. I mean, some people that, I mean, we all experienced it, but we had different reactions to it. And some people, you know, it, it, it brought them down and it was, you know, there were a lot of situ, you know, bad, if you will call them bad things that happened, but it was also empowering for a lot of people too. So again, it comes down to your mindset. And I find really by that's been the biggest takeaway is just by shifting, you know, your mind, your perception of things too, which can really help you. So if you think things are bad, they're going to be bad too, right? I mean, you keep dwelling on that. And and so again, it's really just changing those thoughts, changing the words and just, you know, flipping the switch on the thinking, which can really lift you out of that. Well, and I know it's when, when there's kind of a spiral effect, I think, you know, because I know I can get stuck in a loop, like you start thinking negative thoughts, and then everything looks negative, And then you think more negative thoughts, and then everything looks more negative. Absolutely. How do you, how do you break out of that loop? The, well, the, I say uh, awareness is key. So it's first by recognizing it. So you just said it right there. You you recognize that I'm thinking negative thoughts. I'm starting to spiral downwards. And yes, we can all do it. And it's easy to do because we're so conditioned almost as a society, I think, to think negatively anyways, to always think of the worst thing that's going to happen. That's just almost human nature, it seems. So it takes a lot more effort to think something positive. You know, so instead of thinking, oh, you know, what if this happens? Or I'm not going to do this because what if that happens? It's like, well, what if the opposite happens? You know, so it's really flipping that switch, recognizing it first, and then having either an affirmation or something that you can, you know, immediately say to yourself or when things are going not so well for me, I'll say it that way, or, you know, I'll just say, this is, you know, this is how it looks like while it's all coming together. This is how it's going to play out. This is part of what I need to go through to get to that next level. So it's really self-empowering talks. And uh, again, I'm not going to let that circumstance have me, you know, I'm not going to let, and that's been the biggest takeaway because I did lose a couple of weeks of my life when I had the breakdown where I completely shut down. And that was, that was huge. It's like, I made it out to myself, I'll never go that way again. So I will do anything it takes to prevent myself from slipping down into that. And then, geez, we have so much to be grateful for, Brock. Like really, right? I mean, we really do. And so when you focus on the gratitude, when you focus on the joy, when my husband and I, we love to, when we do, we remind ourselves, it's like, you know, if I'm having, you know, for women, okay, we're having a bad hair day. Okay, well, we have hair. You know, there's some people who don't, you know, or do you know what I'm saying? So when you flip the switch, there's somebody always better off than you. And there may be somebody worse off than you. So sort of put it into perspective that way as well. Yeah, that that perspective can can be really important. We, you know, we become, I think, kind of accustomed to where we are and we we miss out on it might not be as bad as it feels. You know, I, I always think of Wayne Dwyer's quote, no, no one knows enough to be a pessimist, right? Like we we just... Exactly, right? That's good. And also change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. And that's huge. You know, and and for me, that's, that's been a big thing is and I learned that about perception and just looking at things, I call it looking at life through rose colored glasses, which it's not a Pollyanna thing, but it's really just changing how I look at things. And that's, that's actually saved me in a lot of ways. And I didn't even know I was doing it from 
early on when things were really, you know, not so great in my first marriage. That's helped me through a lot of things. Well, let's, let's talk about that a little bit, kind of the, the looking at, at life through rose colored lenses, because, mm-hmm. you know, as you highlighted, there's a lot to be grateful for. And on the other end of it, we, we always have kind of that caution about just that blind optimism, you know, just the Pollyanna. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, you know, I so- know. False positivity, <laughs> all of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So I, I guess t- tell us a little bit about you, kind of your approach and how those rose colored glasses have really helped you. Yeah, it's, well, it started out when I was first married and funny story. So my hus- my first husband and I got married and moved into his place and it was a typical bachelor pad back in the eighties, you know, brown tweed furniture. And it was just like, so not my thing. I'm very feminine. And it was all I could think about was, oh, how much I really didn't like this. So I would actually visual seeing, you know, kind of the style of furniture, what I wanted to see. And we got a little puppy because we thought if we can train a dog, then we'll be able to at least have kids and, you know, be good parents. Like, let's start with the dog first. Anyways, that's another story. But so anyways, the puppy would end up chewing his furniture, this brown tweed furniture. And he, you know, he says, Ryan, are you, you know, smearing dog food on the furniture? It's like, no, I'm not doing that. You know, and we'd put Tabasco sauce and bitter apple spray, but nothing. The dog would eat the furniture. So we ended up getting new furniture. So, but again, it was by visualizing and which is weird. So I'm calling the visualization my way of looking at life through rose colored glasses because I just love pink too. So it was just that technique. So, and then, you know, it's one thing to look at, a, you know, a green couch compared to a brown tweed couch, but when someone starts hurting you or just verbally, or, you know, just being unkind to you, that sort of thing, it's different then. And so for me, I was in a marriage, we had children and, you know, I, I had to, I had to look at him differently. Um, He wasn't going to change. And so I had to change. So it's, I had to look at him. I knew the kind of man he was, I married him and he was a good man and he is a good man. And so I looked at him through a lens of compassion and love. So that's where it really started. So it's, it's looking at people now differently. So we don't know someone's story. We, we don't, you know, somebody could be like, if you've ever worked in customer service and, you know, sometimes people, you know, maybe a checkout clerk will be really rude to you, but you think, oh, are they ever miserable? And, you know, you can say all these things, but sometimes again, you don't know someone's story. You don't know, maybe they've just lost their dog or maybe their child's been hit or, you know, you don't know. And so when we choose to look at maybe somebody else or the circumstance through just a different lens, and that's what I just call those colored glasses. So it's it's not denying that there, you know, is an issue or things, but it's just looking at things differently, just having a different perspective. Again, it's looking for the good. It's so easy to always criticize, condemn, complain, but it's just such negative and draining energy and very toxic to your health and your well-being. So I just choose to look at things differently. And it's it's not a Pollyanna. I've, you know, some people think about me, you know, they think, oh, well, your life looks easier. You it's like you have no idea what I've gone through. And we don't know what other people have gone through, right? And that's the whole thing. Well, and you mentioned several times throughout this conversation, kind of the idea of, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's kind of that visualization mm-hmm. of, of the life you want, the experience you, you want to have. And mm-hmm. it sounds like the, the rose colored lenses are part of that. At least, you know, you kind of visualize the, the furniture that wasn't the brown tweed. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit more about that, because you, like we've been talking about, you know, often at this point in life, maybe we've forgotten how to dream or we wake up and realize we don't remember what we want anymore or we got what we want and what's the next thing now. And do you have kind of a, a specific technique or approach that you use to kind of for that visualization? It's just really, it's, it's being, you have to be very crystal clear on what you want. So you have to take the time and think, okay, what do I want? For instance, you can't say, Oh, you know what? I really want a nice house. Well, what's a nice house. If you go to an architect and you say, hey, can you build me a nice house? What's he gonna, well, you gotta tell me a plan. You gotta have, you know, do you want a four bedroom house, two bedroom, you know, how split level. So when it comes to visualizing what you want, you have to become very crystal clear and put that out there. So once you become crystal clear and, you know, I want a certain house or I want to travel or I want a business or whatever it is that you desire, and it doesn't have to be 
huge or anything. It's just something that you want to change. Maybe you want to meet your, your soulmate or, you know, I want to meet, you know, a man. I want him to be, and you start to visualize though, where are you going to go on your first date? You know, so you start to see that whole process. Oh, and then we're going to go, you know, we're going to go to a movie on our first date. And then, so it's just, it's a whole visualized, it's really having that, the clarity of this is what I want in a man or partner, whatever. So the quality, so you're specific. And then it's just seeing yourself in that picture and, and you become that person as well. So you become that woman or you become that person living in that home and you can see yourself walking throughout that home, you know, smelling the coffee, you know, it's like five cents arising it as well. So it's a whole process of, you know, a visualization and that feeling tone that's attached to it. Like, how good does it feel? You know, when you're in your new home or, you know, you're out for that first date or, you know. And that's what it comes down to. So it's seeing it, it's feeling it, it's believing, it's knowing that it's possible. Like anything is possible, but you have to actually believe that you're also worthy of it too. So there's a lot to it just then. Oh yeah, I just kind of want this. You know, it's not just, you know, blowing up candles on a birthday cake and making a wish. You mentioned right there, not, not only just picturing what you want, but picturing yourself as the person who would have that life. I'd love to hear more about that. So, and I have a program called Soul Power and Soul is an acronym for see it, own it, unleash it, love it. And the owning it is, is exactly that. That's becoming the person that you want to, to be, that you want to have this life. So owning it is just, it's, it's taking on, it's kind of like playing, like having a costume party or playing dress up, right? You know, when you're little, you'd maybe dress up as a doctor or, you know, princess or whatever, but you, you put on that character and you become that character just for one day or one night. But here you're putting on that identity of, I'm going to be the best female entrepreneurial, you know, whatever, you know, businesswoman. Well, what does she look like? What is she doing? You know, so you have to change what you're currently doing or something to become that person. You know, what does that person do? If if you know a successful person that you sort of want to model after, you look at what they do. You know, do they sleep in till noon and then, you know, just sit on the couch? Well, no, of course not. You know, they're out there either making phone calls, they're networking, whatever they're doing. So that's where you have to, you have to change your ways to become that. And then it's like, instead of thinking you have a to-do list, you know, no, it's, you start your day with a to-be list. Who do I have to be to be that person that is living that life that I want to live, right? So that's it. And your to-do list will come after, but first thing in the morning, you, you know, what I do before I even get out of the bed is I prime myself, you know, I prime myself for this is, you know, who I need to be. And you just, you know, this is what I'm doing. And you just kind of build yourself up even before you get out of bed. Yeah. So tell us more about that priming approach. What is it that you, you focus on? Is it like 30 mm-hmm. seconds? Is it five minutes? What's your approach it's, there? Yes, Brock. It's as long as it takes me to yeah. get to that feeling tone. Like, you know, some days we're, we just don't want to get out of bed. We're tired. Maybe our day ahead of us is really overwhelming or it's just a lot. And so it's a matter of me sitting there, laying in bed, and um, it's okay. I, you know, I got this. I can do this. I've got, I know what I need to do. I am the woman that can do this. And, you know, all things are possible. I just keep sort of giving myself affirmations and talking, you know, positively to myself. So a lot of positive self-talk. And it's, it's just putting myself into that situation of who I need to be. So it's like, I'm ready for this. I've got this. I can do this. and and then. The biggest thing for me, though, when I really don't want to get out of bed is I remember my why. It's why that's really why I get out of bed every morning. It's why I do what I do, because I want to help other people. So as soon as I just hit on, oh, why am I doing this? Because that's why, because I want to serve others. That's why I get out of bed. So that's actually why I immediately jump out of bed, because when you also have your why, which is bigger than you and you've got that feeling tone, it's it's attached to you know, you've got such passion to it, that makes you jump out of bed. 
what what did you notice when you first started doing that? I mean, you've been doing it for a while now, so so you know you you know, you know it helps you. But what were kind of some of the first things that you noticed? You know, that first I don't know week or two you started doing it. It's just something that is just puts your whole day in. It just shifts the energy of your whole day. I mean, you can get out of bed. Like I don't use an alarm, and you know, it's it's something I've always gotten out of bed. I'm an early riser, anyways. So it's just shifting that whole energy and you just, you become like a vibrational match. So instead of like getting out of bed uh, and, you know, turning off an alarm or waking up to that noisy thing, because I can't do noise, you, you just get up when you, and you've already primed yourself. You've already sort of built yourself up, you know, because no one else is going to do it for you. So you've got to do it. And once you have that, like you're already ready for the day. So when your feet hit the ground, like, yeah, I mean, I need my coffee and that, but I'm ready to go and I'm empowered and it's a great time. And then I just take my time again. My morning is my sacred time. So I spend a lot of time getting ready and I always have, and, and it's just insane, you know, positive affirmations. I have, you know, some people have a vision board, you know, I have one of those, but I also have an affirmation board. So when I'm getting ready in the morning and I just have all these sayings on it and, you know, I just look at them and, you know, so it's always building myself up. You've been doing this for a few years now. So how would friends describe the the change in you, you know, as you've learned and grown mm-hmm. over the past several years? Oh my gosh, there's just, it's remarkable. Like there's just, it's a, it, it's a complete transformation without a doubt. Like talk about a spiritual awakening, whatever you want to call it. And it all has to do with basically, I call it living a life fueled by soul power. I mean, it's, it's just a brand new way of living, thinking, being. And I've always had, I think, a lot of these things that I've been practicing, even though I didn't put a label or knew, you know, what they were. And I was also very blessed to have, you know, my dad was always, you know, into Dale Carnegie. So I did that when I was like 18 or something because he did it. So he's been very, you know, influential that way, too. So I think I just got so stuck with being in a lot of toxicity and abusive situations that it just really sort of wiped everything away, took everything out of me. So it's just been rebuilding me, but into better all the time. And it's constantly better. And this is what I wanted to do. But again, people try to hold you back sometimes because they don't, maybe they're jealous or they don't want you to be better, if you will, than them. So for whatever reasons, and uh, they're insecure. And so it's a, that's when you have to notice, you know what, you've got to just live your life. And so, well, let's talk about that a little bit, because, I mean, basically, you know, we've been talking about, you know, you can get to midlife and then suddenly realize, hey, I want to change. I think it needs to be mm-hmm. different for, you know, however yes. we come to that conclusion. But people are very used to us being a certain way, like we've trained them, we've taught them, hey, this is who I am. And then we start showing up differently, or we start trying to shift who we think we are or who we want to be. And Um, even in the best of circumstances, people will notice, right? We'll still get a response. And in the worst of circumstances, those people that we truly care about may not be on board with us changing. They like how we were, or we're comfortable anyway with how we were. And and I imagine those you work with kind of experience that, you know, as soon as you start doing a big change, you start showing up in the world differently. And Mm -hmm. How do you, I guess, what, what's your approach to kind of dealing with that and helping bring those along with us who want to come along with us and deal with those relationships? It's just a matter of sometimes it's dialing yourself back. So, you know, because I can get really pumped and excited. Like I'm, uh, like people know me now, like you're pretty happy. Yeah, I am. You know, and, and, but then a lot of times, you know what is really cool is that people think too, like, then I want what she has, you know, I want what you have. So you either, and they, the people who really in your friends and family, co-workers, you know, they either want what you have or they're afraid of it. You know, they're afraid of the light, for instance, and that's on them. That's not something which is hard because we want everyone to like us, et cetera. But at the end of the day, Brock, this is your life. So if you, I'm not going to play small anymore and nor should anyone else. And if you really love me or, you know, like me as a friend, then you're going to say good on you for doing that, like, and be inspired 
to either change yourself or how did you do that? It's like somebody you can be jealous to. It's like if somebody changes, you know, loses, you know, 50 pounds, you know, some people are like, oh, well, look at her. Now she thinks she's something great, you know, but what are you thinking? Why are you thinking that? Are you jealous because you haven't done it yourself because you're afraid to do it or whatever? So there's when you, people aren't happy for you, there must be something like why, you know, and that's up to them to answer that and be responsible. But at the end of the day, you know, again, if you're, you know, you're humble enough and it's just, this is who I am. And, and again, if you look at a, a weight loss, you know, or if somebody, you know, is divorced and then they start dating and then that now they have somebody else, they're happy and, you know, and you're stuck in your miserable relationship. Do, do you know what I'm saying? So I, I'm thinking that those people that are either going to be happy for you, they may not understand. Some people don't understand my friends and, and even my family don't understand what I do. And that's fine, but they love what is done for me. They just may not understand, you know, what I'm doing and that's okay. But again, they're there to support me and encourage me and to keep cheering me on. And that's what you want in good friends and family. And if they can't do that, just accept it and be supportive. And if not, well, then you might have to think about, you know, what else? Because again, this is who I am. So are you going to not like somebody because they lost weight or something? Well, let, let me ask this, Aran. So we, we talked a little bit about the soul power. You you had mentioned, mm-hmm. uh, and you mentioned the own it part, the O part. Um, mm-hmm. What about the the U and the L? So it was what, see it, own it. What, what were the own U it, and the L? Unle- un- Unleash it and love it. So unleashing it is really unleashing that power within. I mean, we can't even breathe ourselves when you think about it. So there is a power breathing us, but we don't even stop to think about that. You know, it's kind of profound almost when you think about it. So you've got that power. You've got to tap into that power. So once you tap into that power that's breathing you, knowing that all things are possible, you know, what's in you is actually greater than anything in your surroundings. So when you start to tap into that in your intuition, and then you can sort of start to decipher, okay, is this really what's best for me or what's not? Because you'll start to understand yourself better. So when you understand and tap into, like you were saying earlier, you know, we just get, we just keep going along in life and we lose sometimes connection with ourselves. So when you come back to who you are and get in touch with that person, um, that being, then you can sort of more things will happen because you'll be in a, a greater flow, if you will. I know it sounds kind of woo woo, but you know it, it's, but it's true. You know, because then again, you're allowing, you're designing your life instead of living by default. You know, default by someone else's, by society, or you know, living according to someone else's agenda. So that's unleashing it. It's that power. It's just tapping into what you already have within you. Just knowing who you are, what you know, your strengths and weaknesses. So those sort of things. And loving it is just loving your life, knowing that, you know, you're going to have failures, if you will, but it's looking at them again. It's it's differently, you know, using those failures as, as a stepping stone to something greater, being less sort of serious with life and just more curious, not being, I call it like neutralizing it. So instead of labeling it as good or bad, it's like, hmm, what do I need to take from this? And it's just all practice. It's all mindset. It's just all awareness. And it's just taking what you need to move you forward. And again, it's just having a clear vision. You want to wake up every day saying, I love my life, you know, and we get to this point in midlife, like, even when you say it midlife, like you can say, oh, it's midlife, like, oh, it's halfway over. Or it's like I was saying earlier, before we started, this is like a reset. Like you've got this wealth of knowledge now. Now, I mean, and a lot of times, you know, maybe we've got the freedom now. We can really choose. I mean, maybe our children have grown. So this is our time. So this is time to sort of invest in yourself. Absolutely. And and so that actually segues nicely into kind of, you know, as we start to wrap up, kind of have a final question mm-hmm. here just around, what do you most enjoy about midlife? I mean, clearly you're fired up about it. You enjoy this stage of yeah. life, but, but what do you like most about it? I'm free to be me. Like I have, you know, found myself, which is great. And I think when people do find their truth, and that's why it's live your true you, when they find their truth, they live, you know, un- unapologetically, they live as their authentic self, which takes 
time to to get to that point in some cases because we've got so many layers of everything else and other people's opinions on top of us. So it's so liberating and freeing. And um, yeah, it's just so wonderful to be able to wake up and do what you love to do. And that's, I think, another thing. So I look at it like, what's it costing people to stay where they're at? You know, and how long have you been there? You know, if you're in an unhealthy marriage or unhealthy job, you know, what's it costing you, you know, as far as your time, your health, and how long have you been there? Maybe it's time to change. Well, so if people are, you know, want to find out more about you, want to connect with you, what, where can they find you? What's the best way? Yeah, you can find me at liveyourtrueyou.com. You can work with me at liveyourtrueyou.com forward slash work with me. I'm on Instagram, live your true you. It's all about live your true you. Well, Rianne, this has been fantastic. I, I've enjoyed this conversation. I, of course, always love talking to people who are just fired up and living a great life in their midlife. And I appreciate kind of the, the information, the ideas, the inspiration around it. Thank you so much for being on today. Thank you so much for having me, Brock. Have a great day. Great life.